Let's take a look at Class 8 applications so we can monitor the routes of all of the trucks that we've sold through our remote diagnostics technology. And what we see there is 35% of trucks average 250 miles or less per day, making them ideal for today's Class 8 battery electric vehicle ranges. And that assumes that they can return to base each night. So that leaves 65% of trucks sold that average more than 250 miles a day. So to cover the entire industry with zero emissions, we either need improved battery technology combined with a nationwide rapid charging system, or perhaps hydrogen fuel cells combined with a nationwide hydrogen infrastructure would be needed to support a 100% zero emissions future. And it's likely a combination of those two things. So for some perspective on the hydrogen technology, our sister company, Kenworth, has taken the lead in hydrogen, hydrogen truck development at PACCAR. And they've delivered eight hydrogen fuel cell tractors to customers already. And these were the ones that are developed in partnership with Toyota. They're currently running in Southern California, real world applications, real world miles, and they have great results so far. So when this technology is proven and the hydrogen infrastructure is widely available, I think fuel cells could be you know, part of the solution that, gets, uh, that allows for a potential zero emissions future. There's no one size fits all in order to come to a zero emission vehicle future, ladies and gentlemen. And if you look at the tree here, by the way, battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles are not competing initiatives, right? They are both electric vehicles. The big difference is that the one has the energy on board and the other one has a generator uh, with a hydrogen fuel cell uh, then on board in order to get there. The development into fuel cell technology is going to be an intense one. It requires a lot of R&D. Um, and and then, then you need volume at a certain moment to kind of, you know, offset the cost. So the initiative between Daimler then and, and the Volvo Group was, well, why don't we do the development together in a joint venture? So it's a separate company. It's called Cellcentric. Separate company uh, has nothing to do with Daimler and nothing to do with Volvo other than the ownership is in a joint venture situation. Cellcentric has as the goal to develop fuel cell electric technology and prepare that for sale. And by the way, not only for Volvo and for Daimler, by the way. They are an, a company on its own that, that bring that technology. Then, uh, when that technology is available, it will end up within Volvo and it will end up within Daimler. And then we will deploy that and commercialize that. But at that moment, it's completely separate. With fuel cell technology, it will be the same thing. We will develop it globally. Right? And then it will be deployed uh, there where it makes sense. So in Europe, in North America, uh, and we expect that to happen somewhere in the second half of this, of this decade. Mass CO2 neutral transportation on the roads by 2050. In order to do this, to cover this wide portfolio of customer applications, to take care of the long range, to take care of the high utilization vehicles, we are committed to pursuing electrification in a dual technology strategy. We have battery electric vehicles, the ones we talked about quite extensively. And then the other element we are pursuing is hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. By next year, 2022, Daimler Trucks vehicle portfolio globally will include battery electric vehicles, North America, Europe, and Japan. And in the next few years, we also intend to supplement that with series produced hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. You may be aware already, but if not, we have formed a joint venture uh, in collaboration with Volvo. Cellcentric is the name of the company to develop and produce fuel cell, fuel cell technology. Hey, uh, Vic, this is uh, the uh, Zanzef pilot truck, one of them. So there are 10 of them that have been built. And, and uh, as Vic said, two of them are going to TTSI and UPS uh, as well, and, and uh, uh, Toyota Logistics and uh, Southern Counties. Uh, so there are um, several fleet operators that are using these trucks uh, in, the, in the ports and uh, getting lots of uh, good data off of these trucks. Now, these were built with our Gen 1. Uh, Mirai uh, fuel cell stacks, um, but event, again, very capable trucks uh, and uh, in, uh, in pilot operations today. I mean, the, the real benefit that we see from heavy duty, though, is uh, the dramatic increase in the hydrogen consumption versus light duty. So 
uh, that really helps drive down the molecule cost and, and benefits light duty from, from implementing in heavy duty. We are focused on a fully integrated trucking solution that includes the battery electric uh, vehicle solution and the fuel cell vehicle solution because we believe that both have a very important place in customer needs. And also the ability to maintain the trucks um, with uh, through our, our dealer network, which we feel very good about as, as we're building that up, that we believe that this is going to provide industry leading service solution and sales. And of course, the energy part, which is so important for these technologies. Um, this is why we selected dealers that have extensive power generation experience and why we have an integrated energy company within Nikola is building out this infrastructure and doing it safely, reliably, and at target cost is so important. And as we all move forward, there are things that are going to change. It's great to be part of an industry that is so focused on lowering carbon intensity. This is a great thing for the planet. It's a great thing for the industry. And to do it with digital solutions that will drive more efficiency, better ergonomics for drivers, better impact on communities. Um, but also, we can't forget that some things don't change and can't change, which is uh, fleet operators need um, safety, they need reliability, they need to meet total cost of ownership targets that they expect will continuously improve. And so that's something that we are absolutely focused on. And at Nikola, we're looking at the entire value chain of how we do that from purpose-built production, purpose-built trucks, dealers that can sell, maintain, and offer power uh, solutions to customers, an integrated energy solution, and sites to either charge at uh, customer depots or fueling stations. So we're a company of very important partnerships. Uh, we are continuing to build on that. We are working very hard, head down, focused on execution, and just uh, very, very proud to be part of an industry that is so innovative and is going to deliver such great uh, results for, for customers and for the markets at large. Uh, so first of all, I mean, it's an exciting time for the industry because this is not a nice to have type of technology. This is a technology that is being pulled by private industry, by government. Um, certainly operators want to see vehicles that have extended life, uh, lower overall cost. Uh, so the, the conditions are ripe. I'd like to say that we're at, we're, all of us are at the right place at the right time. And we think at Nikola, we've got the right uh, business model to to uh, accomplish our goals. But it's going to require a lot of effort from an infrastructure standpoint to make the, the changes that are required. And in order to do it safely, reliably, and cost. Cost is critically important. And so we're all in the early days. And if you take battery electric vehicles, uh, customers want to charge those vehicles at, at their sites. Uh, they, they These are vehicles that typically are Nicola Trey we designed for a 350 mile range initially. These are day cab uh, daily use vehicles that go out, accomplish their mission, uh, come back to home, and they need to be charged. Now charging requires significant infrastructure as you take trucks that in our case are 750 kilowatts. You start to add up trucks at a site, that's a lot of power. Um, and that's why we are highly focused on having an integrated energy solution as we work with customers. That's why for us, our dealers are so important because they're not only selling these vehicles and they're very well, highly capitalized companies. They provide great service, but they have deep power generation expertise. And uh, as part of a customer solution, we're gonna have to look at the fully integrated energy use. And in some cases, customers will benefit from microgrids and peak shaving opportunities to lower their energy costs. So this is, this is a massive, lift and it involves utilities and power companies and, uh, and and that's just to make sure that energy is there when, when you need it and if the grid goes down there's resiliency and as we are able to build that out in an expeditious, safe, reliable and cost effective way you're going to see stronger and stronger adoption. On the hydrogen uh, side of the business for fuel cell vehicles that's a pretty big shift in infrastructure. The great news is that hydrogen is front and center um, with, with governments because of energy independence, because it's a great molecule uh, to deploy uh, from a power density standpoint. And um, there's a lot of funding that's going into it, but that's gonna require 
stations, in some cases in terminal fueling, but massive levels of production at scale. And that's also what we're uh, focused on. We recently announced a collaboration with a great energy company in, in Europe, uh, Open Grid Europe. It's a pipeline um, company that is focused on transitioning pipeline over time to hydrogen pipe. Why is that important? Because distributing hydrogen um, is, is costly and uh, doing it by pipe is going to help lower the uh, cost of delivering the molecule to the truck. And so we're very focused on making very careful uh, decisions and collaborations to uh, be able to provide hydrogen at scale through ourselves or partnerships or buying hydrogen where that's available, distributing it economically and ultimately having locations like our travel center arrangement where we're going to start here on Ontario and places where um, it's good for customers, available sites um, to, to bring their trucks and, and fuel them up with hydrogen and go about their business. Because if you survey customers' fleets, the number one point of interest for them is safety. Now, when they're talking to us, it's price. But, um, but safety is at the forefront of everything that they do. And so the headline in the businesses that we're in is zero emissions of the vehicles. But the beauty of this is the advancement in the technology that makes it safer for the driver and also ergonomically the experience, fatigue, which ultimately impacts safety, reduces because these are quieter environments. There's less vibration. They're, they're more user friendly. And as all of you know, drivers are in short supply. And so fleets are interested in this technology. You add an additional factor is do our drivers like being in these trucks? And one of the things I love to do is to talk to drivers, you know, and I'm in there in the cab and I'm sure my peers do the same. I say, hey, it's just you and I. And of course, now I'm talking to a group here. Um, but I say, hey, tell me the truth. You know, tell, tell me everything. I want to know. I, I want you to tell me what's good. I want you to tell me what you would change. And, you know, the theme consistently, and this is, applies to electric vehicles, whether they're BEV or fuel cell, is, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. This, I don't want to, this is amazing. And it's so hard after drivers spend time in these vehicles to get them back into uh, ICE vehicles because the experience and the, and, the, and the advancements of this are so good beyond just the emissions part, which is so important. And, um, and, and I, think, I think it's just a statement in terms of the maturity of, yes, we're up and coming companies, but we're all thinking about it the, the right way, which is we're all talking about safety, durability, total cost of ownership. These aren't science projects. You know, this is focused on what the industry needs. So, um, there are ways to immediately reduce the cost of hydrogen today. And then this is before you get to scale with a lot of innovation and efficiency of devices like electrolyzers and technology um, with different sources of how you, you produce it. Um, in the case of Nikola, the two examples I can speak to today. We have a very favorable electricity rate with Arizona Public Service, which is a utility which comes from a very innovative way to get electricity, which you know, can be a very significant part of how you produce hydrogen. And that's taking advantage of electricity when the costs are low and stopping production when the costs are high and taking a blended rate of electricity that is extremely competitive, having the ability to produce hydrogen at large scale during the times that electricity are available, complemented by some other things, that ultimately uh, delivers a reduced cost of hydrogen molecule that makes it extremely competitive. Another example that um, we just made an investment of 20% of a project in Indiana, Wabash Valley Resources, using feedstock through a, a process uh, that will deliver very uh, competitive rates of hydrogen. It's a very different way to produce hydrogen than the utility e example that I just mentioned. And there are many more. And it's this continuous effort to look for opportunities where you can achieve feedstock, whether that be from the utility or through some process that delivers hydrogen at the scale that you need, at the quantities that you need um, to, to uh, supply it to the vehicles. And the beauty of hydrogen, of course, is that it's everywhere, right? So we talk about sources of fuel, and some countries are very privileged and, and benefit from having resources. Um, that allow for, uh, you know, to power under existing conditions, and some don't. And it's become a real issue in the world, and this is why governments are so interested in progressing energy, so that there's real resiliency in the world, and you can produce uh, needed energy sources anywhere, um, 
where you are. And that's something that hydrogen and time will, will provide. And that's why there's so much investment, so much interest in seeing this technology progress. Um, and, that, and that's what ultimately will provide benefit to this industry. So while we're in the early days, there are already uh, ways to reduce the cost of ownership. And the question in terms of how is it regulated? Well, first and foremost, it's regulated by our customers. If you can't get the price of the fuel to meet the total cost of ownership models, you don't have a business. So the immediate check on whether this works or not is coming from the demand side. The, the one thing that I'm extremely proud of in, in what we've been able to do in the last year is, is uh, partner with um, leading dealer companies. Uh, because this, this is so imperative ultimately in terms of as we deploy trucks into the marketplace, um, the ability to have uh, state-of-the-art leading service with in existing infrastructure, part supply, a, a, a culture of customer uh, focus, responsiveness, um, is absolutely key for customers. We talked about this, some things are changing and other things are not, and uptime is everything. It also provides uh, a huge impact and, and effect in terms of our ability uh, to sell trucks because these companies are very well established in, in their um, territories and they're trusted. These are credible organizations. Uh, it allows us uh, to spend more money in terms of development, um, engineering, uh, versus infrastructure to support the vehicles out in the field, uh, which is uh, very important in terms of how we deploy capital. We are adding very talented people every day at, at Nikola. I, I think the best kept secret at Nikola are the people. I mean, I would invite you all to visit us, see our, our Coolidge facility, visit us in Ulm, Germany, where we have a, a facility there uh, through our joint venture partner, Aveco. Um, we are driving a culture that is based on strong values, great passion, innovation and customer focus um, and absolutely safety every single day have we uh, as we've been dis discussing here yeah the the challenges are the ones that we all face um, we can't uh, build trucks fast enough right there's supply chain issues that the the entire world is facing not too far away from here the port of la is a complete log jam you see ports in asia uh, the same these are challenges that the industry faces the great news for us is uh, customers need trucks. They need trucks of any type uh, right now. There's just a shortage of trucks. There's a shortage of drivers. This is why these solutions, aside from the benefits of zero emissions, is how do we help customers just do more with what they have? How do you drive up efficiency? How do you recruit more drivers? How do you get trucks in their hands um, after they've proven out the technology, they like it, and it meets their needs? So uh, there's a lot of great work ahead, and I, I think we all are benefiting from a real tailwind here. This is not just a, a step change in technology. This is something, as Craig was saying, that customers need. They're, they are demanding these solutions. They want to see them. They want to make sure that they are going to meet their needs. And as they do that, the adoption rate of this technology is going to be massive. We're all going to have to stand behind our products. We all are taking risks in what we do every day. And in the early days, we'll have to take some risks in terms of residual values and warranties. And ultimately, customers want a one-stop shop uh, to address the, their vehicle concerns, uh, maintenance, et cetera. Uh, we're working with two financial uh, companies, uh, and, and we're deep into the discussion on residual values, as, as was been noted here on the panel. When you look at a, the, the vehicles on a component-by-component -component basis, obviously, they're, you can build uh, some estimates on residual values. There's a whole business that can exist with batteries after they have exhausted their life on the vehicles. Uh, that's that's probably a subject for, for a different <laughs> panel. I'd love to get into that. Eric, we have a new session idea for you. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> because there there is value in that. Um, and, and my hope and expectation is in time that these, these vehicles, uh, one, uh, fleets will be keeping them in their fleets for a longer period of time. That's important to make the TCO work. But from a durability standpoint, that's a great solution for a customer. And, and as that happens, the TCO, I'm sorry, the residual value should be strong.